This is OTR-FM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Welcome to Cracked, the podcast, the program that slays the dragons of mental health by stripping away the shame, embarrassment, fear, and stigma. Because mental health isn't something that affects just some of us, it applies to all of us. Here to shine a new light on areas of mental health that often go unvisited are your hosts, Rebecca Shaper and Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello, and welcome to Crack the Podcast with me, Sandy Sedgbeer. And me, Rebecca Shaper. And we're delighted to welcome back former Washington Post reporter, award-winning journalist, best-selling author, and Pulitzer Prize finalist Pete Early, whose best-selling book, Crazy, A Father's Search Through America's Mental Health Madness, chronicled the horrifying reality of what happens to mentally ill people who break a law in America. And we're even more thrilled that this time Pete's son, Kevin, joins us to share his perspective, perspectives and experiences. Um, Pete, thank you for returning. Kevin, thank you for joining us too. It's strange to think that we know so much about your story from your dad's book, but we cannot know what that journey was like for you. And we're so grateful to you for being open enough to share that with us. Yes. No problem. Pete, can we start by briefly recounting some of the behavior changes you noticed at the start of Kevin's mental health journey so that our audience can have some idea of what to look for? And for those viewers who didn't watch our first podcast with you, could you briefly outline it? Absolutely. Um, Kevin was in college. He's an artist. He was at the Pratt Institute in New York and Brooklyn. Uh, and we talked every Sunday. And on this particular Sunday, uh, he said, Dad, um, food doesn't taste good. I, I, it just doesn't taste good. And I became concerned. And I said, what do you mean? What do you mean? And he really didn't want to talk about it. And then he called and he said, look, I, I think I took some homeless people to breakfast this morning, but I'm not sure. I'm, I'm having trouble knowing when I'm dreaming and, and what's reality. Well, I raced to, uh, to New York and we were able to see a psychiatrist. Um, my wife arranged that. And she, he told me, he said, Pete, if you're lucky, your son is using drugs. If you're not, he has a mental illness, bipolar disorder. And I thought, who says that? You're lucky if your son is using drugs? I had no idea about mental illnesses. And he prescribed medication and Kevin took it for a while. And I was so so uh, uh, ignorant about these things. Uh, when Kevin stopped taking it, I didn't think anything of it. When you have a headache, you know, you take an aspirin or whatever. And when it goes away, it goes away. Well, a year went by. And then all of a sudden I got a frantic call from his brother. And he said, come to New York, please. Kevin is crazy. And I raced to New York and I picked him up. He'd been wandering around the city for five days. He barely slept. He was convinced that God had him on a special mission. And during the four and a half hour ride from New York to where I live outside Fairfax, uh, outside Washington, D.C., Kevin would laugh one minute and then he'd break into tears. And I pleaded with him to take that medication. And he told me, pills are poison. Leave me alone. Well, I drove him to an emergency room because I didn't know where else to go. And I didn't have a family psychiatrist. And they put us in a room all by ourselves and we waited and we waited and we waited. And after four hours, Kevin said, there's nothing wrong with me. Um, I want to leave. And I raced out and I literally grabbed a doctor and I'll never forget how he came in that room. He came in with his hands up as if he was surrendering. And he said, I can't help your son. I said, you haven't even examined him. And he said, it doesn't matter. Virginia law was very clear at the time. Unless a person posed an immediate, imminent danger to themselves or others, they could not be required to take medication or seek treatment. Uh, that's just the rule in the United States and often in other countries. And the fact that we'd been sitting there four hours and Kevin hadn't hurt anyone, 
meant that he wasn't an intimate danger. And the nurse who'd admitted us had told him that uh, Kevin didn't want to take any medication. So he turned to me and he said, you seem like a concerned father. You bring him back after he tries to hurt you or hurt someone else. Well, Kevin came back. Uh, he, 48 hours later, he slipped out of the house. He broke into a stranger's house to take a bubble bath. Five officers uh, took him out and I attacked dog. And Kevin suddenly became one of the two million Americans who are booked into jail every year who have a mental illness. One of the 350,000 Americans who end up in jails and prisons, not because they've really done anything horrible, but because um, they have an illness. And that was the beginning of our journey. That's how I remember it. Um, Kevin may have a different memory of, of all this. Is there anything you want to add to that right now, Kevin? Um, well, it happened a long time ago. I'd like to add that. Um, yeah. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. hear these stories and they get an idea about me, but, um, you know, a lot of change and redemption and growth has happened in my life. So I like to make that point because people remember the sensational stuff and the yes. sensational yeah. stuff happened when I was in my early 20s and uh, my life has kind of calmed down a little bit since then. But that's, that's pretty much the gist of it. Yeah. Well, you know, the story of your recovery and your subsequent training and advocacy is so inspirational. Um, and we won't ask you to repeat some of the grimmer details in your dad's book. We went through that before. But there are some things about your experience that would be very helpful to uh, viewers. Yeah. And um, one of the things that I'm curious about is that you tried several times to get rehabilitated and that failed. What do you think was the cause of the failures? Was it the lack of help, the system, or were you just not ready at that point? I think for me and the line of work that I do, um, something that I notice is that it, the people who are successful are the people who are able to have some sort of individual um, like moment of accountability where they realized that, um, you know, for me, I had to realize it wasn't the CIA, it wasn't the FBI, it wasn't my family, it wasn't my peer group, it wasn't like the Freemasons or the Illuminati, it was me who had to be accountable for my behaviors and my actions. I couldn't blame these outward entities that I had conspiracies about that were influencing my life. I had to take accountability for my own actions and my behaviors. And when I was able to do that, I looked at what I had been through. I looked at what I had done. I looked at um, what my options were, how I could, you know, reintegrate back into society. And for me, the choice I made was to take medication, which helped out me personally. I know it's not for everybody, but for me, it helped me out when I got on the right meds. When I wasn't on the right meds, um, I had a different outcome, but when I got on the right meds, uh, got linked up with the treatment team, got linked up with a great case manager. I was on a jail diversion team that helped me get an apartment, helped me get a job, helped me medication, psychiatrist. So I had wraparound services. I had a supportive family. I had a supportive peer group. So um, it really took a moment of... Uh, responsibility and accountability on my behalf in order to kind of initiate this recovery process. So if I may jump in here, what Kevin told me, and uh, I'm not going to put words in his mouth so he can respond after I say this, but we went through six years. We went through five hospitalizations. We went through an awful lot. Of, uh, I did a lot of things wrong. Uh, I mean, at one point, I um, I took his pills and ground them up and put them in food, trying to get him to take them. And of course, that led to a really awful uh, confrontation between us, where he he left my house. Uh, but 
when he this the the final hospitalization and i thought this was key he accepted that he was ill and he told me he woke up and it had been all these hospitalizations and by this time too um I had called the police on, on Kevin at one point, and he'd been shot with a taser by the police. Uh, I mean, this is the horrific things that, that we had gone through. But he looked at that, and he said, I can't make excuses anymore. He accepted he had a mental illness. And I think that's really hard for people to do. Who wants to think there's something wrong because of all the stigma and the fear and the, oh, you're crazy type thing? Who wants to accept that? He also, his older brother was having our first grandchild and they said they wanted him to be part of her life and they were worried. So he had a, he had a reason to want to get better. And then a doctor scared him. He said, every time you have a break, you're killing part of your brain. And so at the time he told me it was these three factors. It wasn't my badgering. It wasn't my threats. It wasn't my grinding up his food. He came to that point, and then, God bless her, we got a case manager, and she really jumped in. And she did exactly what Kevin did. She got him a job. She got it, and she told him about peer-to-peer. Um, you know, I mean, his first job, uh, or the job she, he ended up with, was collecting carts outside of store. And this is a talented guy, and everybody else was moving on with their life, and He's collecting carts, and he was told, no, 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 you're doing great by one of the counselors. Come and talk to my group. And I think when he talked to that group, he realized how well he was doing, and he went from someone who needed help to someone who could help others, and in that process was able to, to grow. That's my view of what happened. Kevin, um, would you like to tell us about the peer-to-peer process and how it helped you? Um. Well, I didn't even know what a peer was, basically. I just knew I was pushing shopping carts, and my case manager came up to me and told me she had a job she wanted me to do, and she told me what it paid, and it was more than pushing carts. So I was like, sure, I'll give it a shot. So um, when I got on part of the jail emergency team, I think there were only like four or five peers in the county I was working in at that time. It was a relatively new profession. I know it's exploded since then. Uh, because of the groundwork that people like me have laid in Virginia, at least. I know some other parts of the country already have established peer, but in Virginia it was a relatively new field, so I got to kind of define my own role and learn on my job and through my peer-to-peer training like how to kind of do the work that I do. And it's really it's kind of counterintuitive because when you think about um, the way that people are trained. I know this now because I've been to social work school and I have an MSW master's in social work, but the things they teach you in school are different than the things that a peer does. You have the medical model and peers kind of exist outside of the medical model. So it's interesting for me because I'm operating alongside the medical model with all these other clinicians I'm working with, but the work I'm doing is kind of outside it. So it's not as much about um, the things that they train you to do when you're a clinician. It's more about listening, showing respect, uh, sharing common humanity, and the big phrase that you hear everywhere, just meet people where they are at. So I've had clients that I met, and, um, you know, I don't even tell them my story until, like, the fourth or fifth visit because I'm just trying to gauge where they are, let them tell me about themselves, and just kind of be present with them and just kind of get to know them a little bit. And then I'll tell them, oh, well, I have mental illness too. And they'll look at me and they're like, what? Like, what do you mean you have mental illness? And I'll tell them a little bit about my story. And you see that spark in their eyes when you tell them that. And it builds that connection. And you build that trust and that respect. And that makes the, the role that the clinicians on the team have easier when I can build that court sort of bridge between myself and the client. I could see where that would just be so helpful because Kevin, you can, you see that person that you're helping. You, you see them and you, you empathize with them because you've experienced it as well. And I think 
an individual who has experienced something that someone else is going through speaks volumes. Yeah. yeah. And that was something I, that was, um, I went to my case manager and said, how am I going to get a job? You know, I have mental illness, I have a criminal record. You know, how am I going to get employed? And she said, we want you because you have mental illness. We want you because you have a criminal record. So it really made me feel valued to work. Mm -hmm. I don't have to hide anything because I've had jobs where I don't mention my mental health status. And this one, I'm like, hey, yeah, I have a mental health status. So I, yeah. One of the things you need to understand, I think, as a parent is that you need to <clears throat> embrace peers and this is hard for some parents to do because as Kevin pointed out, the medical model, which is really predominant in the United States is take your medicine, take your medicine, take your medicine, just take your medicine, you know, and some of these medicines, I mean, when Kevin, one of the first medicines he was on, I mean, it turned him into a zombie. I mean, he was, it was just awful. And another one, you know, I mean, it, these are hard to figure out and our system is not designed to take the time you need to find those right medications. But a lot of parents initially resisted peers, and some still do, uh, because they simply want their child or loved one to take your medication. And peers often, um, and Kevin can speak this better than I can, um, often look at ways in a, besides medication, or they don't want to take medication. And so you run into this conflict. And uh, of course, uh, one of the hot button issues in mental health, peers traditionally do not like forced medication. They don't like assisted outpatient treatment where uh, you have to go into treatment. And of course, a lot of parents like assisted outpatient treatment because they want their kid to be required to take medication. So it gets, it gets complicated, you know? And when uh, Kevin first got sick, I mean, I offered to pay him money if he'd take his medication. Uh, I ground it up in his food. I told him that if he didn't take his medication, he couldn't live with me. And these, if you have a peer in there, uh, I think they can be a, a bridge. But there's still a lot of parents who, who are very resistant to peers even, even today. And they'll say things like, well, if my my psychotic kid has a peer. It's going to be someone who just wants to sit around, smoke dope, and tell us he isn't sick. Mm -hmm. So it's a emerging field that is underpaid and I think undervalued. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm sorry, Sandy. One yes, quick question. Have you thought about bringing in the parent with the person that has the mental illness so they can see the work? I mean, is that done in the peer peer to peer. I'm kind of familiar with it, but I'm just curious. Do you mean like, do I meet with parents? Yeah. Like inviting the parents with their, um, it depends, I think it depends case to case. So okay. uh -huh. there are some clients I've met where I have met the parents, but it really, if the peer doesn't want you to meet the parents, it's up to the peer. So, you know, there are yeah. some where I have met the parents, but um, usually it's a clinician who talks to the parents and if they want to meet me, then that can be arranged if the peer is okay with it. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Pete, I'm, I'm curious because you'd, you'd gone through a lot before that process began, um, mm -hmm. you know, before the peers, before um, Kevin had made his decision to turn things around and you had many, many experiences that led you to mistrust one another. Um, two things come to mind for me. How did you rebuild your trust in each other? And how did you react when Kevin went into that peer-to-peer -peer process and perhaps now it, you were more detached from it all? I was absolutely delighted with the case manager he got. I mean, finally, someone was listening. Finally, someone, you know, look, the first time Kevin was hospitalized, um, you know, I went to see him. He was, it, what was his treatment? His treatment was take this medication and sit around in a group and complain about how your life is awful. And after three days, well, we're going to kick you out. And hopefully the medication works. And if it doesn't, but you haven't, 
you haven't given anyone the tools they need to really move forward. You just slapped a Band-Aid on there and shoved them out the door. And that's why you get this repeat of, of, of people getting on meds, going off meds, getting sick, not getting help, ending up yeah. in this revolving door. Yeah. I think that, um, yeah, we had, you know, I mean, one point Kevin got angry and jumped out of my car. You know, we had conflict. But I think, or I'd like to think that he always felt that I was trying to help and that I was not going to abandon him. And in fact, I think one of the most moving passages in the book is where it's my birthday and he makes me a card and he recalls this time in his life when he was little and uh, he, he slipped and fell down. We were in South Dakota. He slipped and fell down this kind of ravine and I went down and pulled him out. And of course, over the years, it became a cliff and I became this super dad who's you know, climbed down the face of this cliff to save my son uh, when it wasn't quite that much dramatic. But I, I realized that he mentioned that story and I realized that, um, that I couldn't always save him, but I could be there trying anytime he wanted to try to get help. That's really difficult for a lot of parents because not all parents are fortunate enough to have a son like Kevin who, yeah, we went through six years of it, but we never lost that communication. And I have met parents whose kids have been homeless for years and years and years on the streets and don't want any contact. And, and sometimes the family just gets burned out. Yep. I mean, these are awful illnesses. And you look at Kevin and you see how successful someone can be. Yep. But, you know, our jails are full of people who aren't successful. Our streets are full of people who aren't getting that kind of help. And this is an outrage that we should be doing more to try to reach those people uh, and, and help them. Yeah. I, I, to I totally agree. Absolutely. And, you know, y'all's story is similar to the story of my brother when I found him and same situation. Uh, but finally, we got him on the proper medication and he had a, a group that just embraced him and helped him. And But unfortunately, 2012, he passed away. But he had a great life when I found him. Yeah. And um, that's one of the reasons why I just love these type of podcasts to help others know that there is hope. And thank you so much for Kevin, you and Pete speaking and talking about this. Well, I, I think we both feel compelled to speak. I know it gets frustrating for Kevin because when I give my speech, I go through everything that went wrong. And I describe the most embarrassing parts of his life. And he's moved on from that now. Uh, I am stuck there because I'm still trying to show all the horrific things that happen that would need to be changed. Yeah. So, I, you know, you asked about our relationship now. I, we don't do many appearances together. And I think one of the reasons is because I lay out what happened back in the past and what's happening today. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. Virginia Beach uh, guy was picked up, schizophrenia. He was put in the jail there. Uh, he had stolen $5 worth of snack foods. And uh, he was supposed to go to the state hospital. Uh, they lost his paperwork. He died 101 days later from starvation because the guards couldn't get him to cooperate. This is the kind of stuff that's still going on. But I think for Kevin and I, it's difficult sometimes for us to be up here together because he is far down this road and I'm still talking about when he, when he wasn't. And I think that, you know, understandable, but we both have different, different stories to tell. And so uh, I always mention how well he's doing and what helped him. Uh, but I think he would, uh, as all of us would get tired of people talking about it, the worst days in his life. Yeah. We're going to take, <laughs> we're going to take a short break now. You're listening to crack the podcast with me, Sandy Sedgbeer and my co-host Rebecca Shaper. And I guess this week, our award-winning journalist and best-selling author, Pete Early, and his son, Kevin Early. And we're talking about their experiences with the mental health system, much of which was chronicled in Pete's 
Pulitzer Prize nominated book, Crazy, A Father's Search Through America's Mental Health Madness. And um, when we come back from the great the break, we're going to be talking more about Kevin's journey um, now, what life is like for him and what it's like for some of the people that he's uh, advocating for and working as a peer-to-peer with, and also the advocacy that Pete and Kevin are engaged in. So stay tuned. We'll be back with more from Pete and Kevin after this break. The Real Conscious Connection, Ohm Times Radio, IOM FM. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Om Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going Om? My passion is sifting through information, research and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers and researchers, pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4pm Pacific Time, 7pm Eastern Time every Thursday and together we can discover what's really going on. Worried about your friend but don't know how to reach out? You can say how are you or get a fake tattoo. You can ask with an app if it works for you. You can chat with them in VR. It's all good if you think you should check in. Yeah, you should. Whatever, whatever, whatever gets you talking. Reach out to a friend about their mental health. Learn how you can help at SeizeTheAwkward.org. Welcome back. Pete, um, I wanted to ask you a quick question before um, Rebecca jumps in. What has it been like for you to watch Kevin become so strong and such a wonderful advocate for others? I mean, it must be beyond parental pride. Well, I feel like we're very, very close because of what we've been through. I feel like Kevin's illness in a strange way gave me a purpose in life uh, besides writing books. Uh, I mean, I spend 50% of my time doing mental health work now. Uh, It's not something you can walk away from. And uh, I think that, um, yes, I have tremendous, tremendous pride I, that he has been able to go through this and emerge as well, at, as well as he's done. Of course, um, I'm a parent, and that means that I'm concerned because I hear stories about medication not working, or I hear stories about people not taking their meds. Uh, The National Institutes of Mental Health claims that people with bipolar disorder usually stop taking their meds after three or four years because they, and a lot of doctors try to wean people off meds and some do it responsible, some don't. So in the back of my mind, uh, although he's done so well for so long, I'm still concerned about that. You know, I want him to be safe. And what frustrates me is if, if something did happen to Kevin, Uh, if he had a relapse through no fault of his own. And I should point out, too, here, two real quick things. I think we put a lot of pressure on peers not to relapse. And that if they do falter, it's like a drug addict never being able to ever, you know, you have to always be straight. Well, sometimes you're going to fall off the wagon, you know. And I think we put a lot of pressure on peers as examples. So I worry about the pressure that's put on him. But I also am frustrated because if Kevin was sick tomorrow, what's really different? 
and and how would I be able to get him help? And he has a great network that should help, but legally I'd run into the, many of the same barriers I did the first time around. Yeah. And, and that is frustrating. I'm Kevin, sorry. I'm curious, how do you feel about that? Hearing what your father just said. Well, last time I was in the hospital, I made a vow to myself that I would never return. And so far, knock on wood, I haven't uh, returned. But um, I do know persons with mental illness are more likely to die like 20 years before the regular population. So um, there is a lot of stigma still, even with all the awareness campaigns and everything, people still make judgments and uh i just i just try to look at the positive stuff i guess uh, you know I, i'd like to ask you another question kevin um you have a master's degree in, in social work which you spoke about you train through nami and are now a peer-to-peer -peer specialist your yourself what made you commit yourself to that decision i mean what what made you finally decide you wanted to do that I kind of wanted to prove to myself that, A, I could do it. Um, and it was a lot of work. It was a lot of sacrifice, a lot of things I had to give up, a lot of time, uh, financial investment, all of that. I'm in, I'm in debt now with the student loans. Uh, but I wanted to prove that I could do it. And also, if I ever decide to leave the peer community, I wanted to have options as far as employment. And I like the work I do. I like helping people, but I wanted to get the degree because that's sort of legitimate in society's eyes for what I do where they may not take the peer work as legitimately as they should. If you get a degree, they take you more legitimately. And I, I want to jump in here. Kevin was not someone who enjoyed school. Mm. He was not, he enjoyed art school, but high school, et cetera. He was, of all my kids, the one that I would think would have the least interest in ever returning to school was Kevin. So it's a real tribute that he, he went back and, and stuck with it and did it. Kevin, um, how do you deal with someone who is sick and doesn't, and resist help? I think you just have to have patience and you have to realize that they're on their journey and it's their life and they have their, if they don't want to help, you can't force, right. you can't force anything on them. So you just got to be with them while they're in that space and hope that they can, uh, I, I use the adage that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. So it's not my job to get discouraged not my job to get frustrated, even though I may feel that way. My job is to keep showing up, be present with them, meet them where they're at. And if where they're at means they don't want help or they don't want to take measures, that's you just got to be with them and hope hope that maybe they can buy into their own recovery. But if they don't, just be with them as a human being, one human to another, and be with them so that they're not alone going through this. That's I, would, yeah. I would imagine one of the most important qualities is constancy. You've got to be constant and you've got to be there for them regardless. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'd like to tell a quick story here. When I was in Miami, I met a fellow there who actually was uh, worked at the jail. And he said, you know, my sister has schizophrenia. She's had, she was, her sister was 55 years old. She's had it for 30 years. She's had 15 doctors. She's had dozens of social workers. But at the end of the day, I'm the only one who's still there. And I think that is one of the things you're talking about with consistency. I think that's one of the real flaws in our program um, is in our recovery is there is no one person oftentimes who's with someone on this journey. And it takes time to develop trust, especially if you're dealing with someone who's not thinking clearly. So if you're, it's like if you have a, a HMO and you see a different doctor each time, uh, you're not gonna trust that doctor as much as you are someone who you're gonna see 
for 15, 20 years. And we just, the profession is, it's tough to get anybody to stay that long, develop those. And it's tough sometimes, you know, Kevin's not the only one in my family who is mental health. His youngest uh, uh, adopted sister uh, went into mental health work because of Kevin. And some of her clients are not easy to deal with. They are not people who most of us would want to spend time with. And so, you know, how do you form a connection that's professional, but also caring? And, and that's a real gift. Yeah, I think it's so important to uh, have communication with that person that's working with you and the person that uh, is the uh, advocate as well. It, the, the communication has just got to be solid. And I think that that's the most common complaint I hear from parents is that no one will talk to me. You know, HIPAA laws prevent me. They say, oh, we can't talk to you, which is not true. Uh, you can present your history. You can talk to them. And there are some things they can't talk about because there's a client. But it's, I, I'm a firm believer in the family being part of the team. Yep. And unfortunately, a lot of uh, people see the family not as an enemy, but as, as with suspicion or part of the problem. And so they'd rather exclude the family from it. And, you know, a lot of people with mental health don't want their family involved. So it, it's complicated, but I think it works best when you have a family effort. And I was always grateful to Kevin's social worker who followed the law but was very supportive of us and would let us say, hey, you know, um, I'm worried about this. Or, hey, Kevin Kevin came in the other day with a lottery ticket uh, and said he's going to win. Uh, is he off his meds? No, he just bought a lottery ticket. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Exactly. I think the communication is so uh, important, just like you said. Yeah. Well, this isn't a journey you go on alone if you care about someone. Right. <laughs> well, you're not alone on it because everyone around you is affected by it. So they might as well be part of it, you know. Um, yeah. It also helps others feel that they are contributing something as well, I think. And, and also, too, I think it's, it, it's very difficult on the caretaker. So knowing that they have a support team with them, it yeah. helps. I've been there. I know. So, yeah. Pete, um, I read something the other day. I, I think it was a tweet that you'd sent. If you're afraid to tell your story, stigma wins. And in your book, you used Kevin's middle name it, it, to protect his identity. What needs to happen? And I'm sure you've both got answers to this. What needs to happen for us to be able to remove the shame and the blame from mental health issues? Well, let me explain that I did, I used Kevin's uh, middle name in the book because the reason I wrote the book was selfish. I wanted people to know that this was a person and his father could write a book, his father could write articles in the Washington Post because I naively thought that threat would make, make sure he got better help. And I told people, you know, I'm writing a book and you don't treat my son well, I'm going to put your name in the book. You know, I mean, yeah. that, was, that was part of it. Kevin didn't mind me writing the book, but he was still in, uh, his mental illness was still going on when he said, oh, yeah, go write a book. That's fine, you know. Uh, but also it was very difficult for me when I was writing it. I was such an emotional mess. And you got to remember – this book comes out with a happy ending, but it really was just the beginning of four more years of really awful stuff, tasered by the police, etc. cetera. Um, I couldn't write his name. I couldn't write Kevin when I was writing it. it. This gave me a disassociation. And I was going through, as you know, Rebecca talks about as a caregiver, you have your own trauma you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was going down to this jail and looking at people who everyone I saw, I thought this could be Kevin, you know, and that that's hard to live with, yeah. you know, um, you know, stigma. We spend a lot of time on stigma and I, 
I tend to be a person who likes to look at what I think are facts. And I, I get hope by looking at the, uh, the gay movement. Uh, when I was young, nobody ever admitted they were gay. And somehow they turned that around. I mean, in the United States, we just had the gay, gay pride day, mm -hmm. uh, fighting that kind of stigma. I think one of the ways they did it was by humanizing the person. And that's what Hollywood, we've gone from the psycho movies of Alfred Hitchcock to the silver lining playbook. Uh, we've gone for a more realistic. And in fact, in TV shows for a while, um, having bipolar became a real thing, uh, you know, and everybody was having a mental illness. Everybody was having bipolar because it made the character. And, and when that presents it in a positive way, I help. But I think the biggest way to fight the stigma is uh, not necessarily with ads, and all this kind of stuff. It's by people like Kevin and me speaking out. Yes. You know, and, and we both have different stories to tell. Um, I, I can say this. When Kevin tells his story or Pierre tells his story, you cannot help but be touched and gripped by that story. Yeah. Either very, very sad or very proud or inspirational. It's a different thing when a parent or a loved one tells a story. And here's the difference. Most people aren't going to look at someone who's a peer and think that could happen to me. They're not going to look at Kevin and say, that's awful, but it's not going to happen. It's, it's, it's not me. When they look at a parent, um, they look at him and go, oh, my God, that happened to them. That happened to Rebecca's family. That happened. What the heck? That could happen to me. Mm -hmm. And I, then they find other people in their church or people they meet, and they realize, and that gets them involved. If, if you have a human connection, it's like I was put on this federal panel. Why? Because the head of HHS at the time, uh, a good friend of his in their church, their son had a breakdown. And so all of a sudden, they I didn't know anything about mental illness before Kevin got sick. And I was a reporter. I had covered deinstitutionalization, the closing of the state hospitals. I remember getting a call when I was in my 20s in Kansas and a parent calling up and saying, this is awful. They're shutting down these hospitals. I have no place for, you know, I can't take care of my kid. And me hanging up thinking, well, that's a selfish parent, you know. Wow, did I learn a lot, <laughs> you know. But you have to have that human connection. Absolutely. Kevin, um, do you see the passion your father has for you? I'm sure you do. I'm not sure. It, I, I, I can relate to your father and I can relate to you because I've, I've been there on both sides. Um, I just wonder, I just feel the passion that your father has and, and wanting the best for you. Did you feel at times that your father was crossing any boundaries with you? <laughs> Be truthful. <laughs> I know a question, but I, 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 I saw it when I was trying to help my brother. I knew I was. Let me just say that it's Father's Day, and uh, I have a great father. I know a lot of people don't have fathers in their life. I'm very fortunate in the father department. So happy Father's Day. But yes, there were moments when boundaries were crossed. But I just think it's uh, my dad's kind of like the paternal patriarch of the family. Mm -hmm. And I think with that, th there are some good things. But also sometimes he kind of wants, I mean, sometimes I got to step back and let him know, you know, I got this. I can do this myself. And part of it is also just failure. Sometimes kids fail at things. And that doesn't mean that their dad needs to come in and swoop them up and rescue them all the time because uh, you learn from failure. So, uh, I mean, that's a part of it, too. So sometimes he wants to, you know, if there's a bullet coming my way, he wants to jump in front of it and save me from catching the bullet. But sometimes I need to get hit with a bullet so I learn something, you know. Yeah. It sounds like both of y'all have learned lessons throughout this whole thing from each other. Definitely. And that's that's made our relationship stronger. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's really good, um, Kevin. In our last podcast, your dad talked about the crisis intervention team. 
that picked you up when you were walking down the street naked. CIT teams have been under attack recently, and there has been a lot of talking about defunding the police. What is your view of crisis intervention teams and how important are they? Well, I think we need to make a distinction between police forces and crisis intervention teams because I think uh, when we talk about defunding the police, it's not necessarily um, crisis intervention teams. Uh, I have a complicated outlook on the police, especially with things that have gone on uh, recently in our country, kind of this reckoning with police forces our country has been dealing with. Um, I, I had been speaking to the police as part of crisis intervention trainings, but I haven't done it recently with the pandemic going on and with everything going on in the country. I've kind of been reassessing how I should do that. Um, so I think I think any there's, – there's, I don't really know what the solution is. It's a very complicated problem. But when you're ill and you see just the nature of seeing that uniform that they wear, you feel threatened, even if they're the nicest police person in the world and, and everything, and they come up to you very nice and they do everything they're supposed to do, just by seeing that uniform, it carries with it a lot of baggage. So there's no way that police can walk around and not wear police uniforms, though. So, I mean, social workers don't have to wear police uniforms, so that's good. But then you see a lot of these CIT teams that go out in the communities and they want to outfit the social workers like police. And I think that's a bad idea. But I think what is promising is the idea that somebody is responding to your crisis who isn't in that uniform. But I think that uniform, it has a stigma of its own. So that's something that they need to overcome, I think. That is your question. And some CIT uh programs don't require the officers to wear. There's a HBO movie called Ernie and Joe. It's about San Antonio where I've spoken numerous times and their teams respond in civilian clothes. Okay. Uh, I think that what Kevin pointed out too is important. When he got tasered by the police, he was handcuffed and he had not committed any crime, but police automatically were going to take him in a car and they said, well, we have to handcuff you. And that immediately implies that you're dangerous, you're bad, you're an evil person. But that goes back to part of the standard we use, this tricky civil rights thing where we want people to not have their rights taken away from them, but we wait until they're so dangerous that they're then geared to have those rights taken away from them. Now, when Kevin was picked up the second time, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, but the officer put him in the back of the car without handcuffing him. And I think that sends a much different message and an important message. And he thought, like I had more dignity when he did that. Right. And I think he even turned the radio to, to rap music, which you wanted to hear. But he, he treated him as a human being. And, uh, yeah, right now the big move is to shift off the police into uh, mobile crisis response teams, which are mental health professionals. But even in the most sophisticated systems, there's always a, a, a backup of having law enforcement there in case someone uh, becomes violent. I mean, we're, right now what the big thing is we're going to change in the United States our crisis number so like 911 immediately gets you to the police, we're trying to change it to 988, which is a mental health crisis number, a suicide number. And the idea is you get people trained there to triage the calls and say, okay, it sounds like uh, uh, you need an appointment and I'm gonna help you set it up with a psychiatrist. Oh, you sound like you need a mobile crisis response team to come see you. Or no, this person needs the police to respond. Where you can try to eliminate the police as much as possible, which is something they'd like to do, quite frankly. They don't like answering mental health calls. I also and, think the, the bar is kind of low for the training for police. I know in the UK, uh, the training for police is a lot more extensive, a lot longer. In the U.S., it's only however many weeks. but um, 40 hours is the best, but a lot of times it's eight. 
And wow. eight, eight hours is not going to, that's mental wow. health first aid. Uh, true CIT is a 40 hour course. Well, I'm talking about policing in general. Their training is not as extensive in the U.S. as it is in other places. So you got people who aren't getting that much training, and then you're giving them a gun and the right to basically execute people um, and no consequences often for doing so. And then, of course, you're going to have problems when people get executed. When uh, I was on a local panel when after a couple of uh, I. Um, African American woman died in our jail here, tasered to death. And I was on a panel, and um, it was interesting because the police, during a financial crisis, had cut all CIT training. And I said to him, um, "Did you cut firearms training?" Well, of course not. Everyone has to have firearms training. And I said, "Okay, how many times does an officer draw his gun?" And at that point, it was rare and that an officer may never draw his gun during his career. And I said, how many times do you encounter someone with mental health? And it was every day. So you have to understand what the priority needs to be here and priority needs to help people learn how to de-escalate, even if they're not on CIT team teams, so that they don't go in like Rambo and begin shooting up someone who is frightened, scared, et cetera. Mm, yeah. Um, is this initiative to change the number to 988, is that nationwide yes. or statewide? So it's, it no, is it's nationwide. nationwide. And what we're trying to do is use that as a way to get uh, people from calling the police department or going to emergency rooms to have a number where someone who's a professional, the problem, of course, is going to be funding, but a professional who can immediately triage the situation. And when Kevin had his first break, could have said to me, I had no, I didn't know what to do. I went to an emergency room, but could have said to me, don't go to the emergency room. Uh, yes. Here, we're gonna set up an appointment or here, go to now Fairfax County where we live has a mental health center. Uh, take, take your son there, not to the emergency room where there are peers, where there is someone who can do that. Trying to channel them away from this a path to emergency rooms, jail, and prison. This is such a logical, logical solution. I'm shocked that nobody's thought I, of it. Before. I am too. I, yeah. yeah, yeah, and 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 yeah, badly needed. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, I think we both want to know from you know your individual perspectives. Um, What's the best advice that you would give to listeners? And if we have time, if you had the magic wand, what would you change? <laughs> you want to go first, Kev? All right. Uh, the first part of that, I would say my advice would be that redemption is possible. Recovery is possible. Where you are now is not indicative of where you're going to go in the future. You can change. You can thrive. You can live a successful life. As far as a magic wand, I would not necessarily concentrate on mental health segment. I would concentrate on our society in general because I think mental health is a uh, – there's a quote I like to use by R.D. Lang, and he says, uh, insanity, a perfectly rational adjustment to an insane world. And I like it because I think if our, if our society becomes more empathetic, more positive, less judgmental, less militaristic, I think we'll have a better society. I, I think for me, and I actually wrote down some of the things I've learned that, uh, on this uh, weekly blog that I write, um, I had to learn how to go from being a parent to a partner and, and listening to Kevin and listening to him even when he wasn't making much sense and saying, okay, okay, how can I help you, you know, how can I help you get to where you want to go? I know you don't want to live at home. I know you, you know, these things. And the hardest thing for a parent is to do what Kevin said which is to realize that you can't rescue someone, um, that, that this is an Ill, illness and sometimes you're not gonna win the battle. 
And, and that just is a ho horrible feeling. But it, it's you have to realize your own limitations. Yeah. I'm afraid that we are right out of time now. Are we going to have to leave it there? But um, I'd like to encourage everybody to go to your website, um, peteearly.com, and that's E-A-R-L-E-Y.com. I couldn't find a website for you, Kevin, so uh, I'm assuming you're happy with that? www.getthatworm.com. <laughs> Get Get that Getthatworm.com. That's my website. Okay. All right. Well, check that one out as well. Pete, Kevin, thank you for Love being it. with us today. Yeah, th this was fantastic. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, that's it for today. I'm afraid Fathers uh, Crazy, A Father's Search Through America's Mental Health Madness is the title of the book. Um, we'll be back next week, at the, uh, the week after at the same time. Till then, it's goodbye from me, Sandy Sedgebeer. And me, Rebecca Shaper. Thank you.